Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's seminar where we'll be previewing Geoscience Australia's Science Strategy 2028, which will be released later this month. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. James Johnson, the Chief Executive Officer here at Geoscience Australia, and welcome to everyone joining us. Today, I'll be providing an overview of the overarching framework in which the Science Strategy 2028 will operate. And in particular, I'll speak on why we need a science strategy and the role of science excellence in our overarching decadal plan, which we've entitled Strategy 2028. In my, after my overview, I'm going to be handing over to Dr. Steve Hill, who's uh, Geoscience Australia's Chief Scientist, and he'll give you a preview of Science Strategy 2028. Before his current role as Chief Scientist with us, uh, Steve was the Chief Government Geologist of uh, South Australia and the Director of the Geological Survey of South Australia, and also had a career as a lecturer at the University of uh, Canberra and Adelaide University. Steve will be bringing you a taster on how our new science strategy will guide the way that we work every day and the way that we apply science that forms our core business at Geoscience Australia. But I just want to start my presentation by, by talking about, uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on for today's seminar. And for me here in Canberra, that's the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I want to extend my respect to any First Nations people who are joining us in the audience today. My acknowledgement of country also provides the opportunity to highlight and reinforce Geoscience Australia's commitment to respectfully engage and collaborate with Australia's First Nations people as outlined in Strategy 2028. And Steve will touch on that more when he's outlining the science strategy. Building on this commitment and relevantly to today's seminar, Geoscience Australia's science strategy outlines how this engagement and collaboration translates to the way that we conduct our science in embracing Indigenous science and its exchange with non-Aboriginal science. Steve will outline how our science strategy more broadly presents a new approach in uniting the key strategic strands of how Geoscience Australia undertakes its science and its business, including through diversity and inclusion and incorporating our reconciliation action plan. Nevertheless, this captures just one way in which our new science strategy answers the question of how Geoscience Australia will operate to meet its long-term decadal vision outlined in Strategy 2028. So I launched launched Strategy 2028 back in 2019, and it was with a clear vision for the next 10 years for Geoscience Australia to be the trusted source of information on Australia's geology and geography for government, for industry and community decision making. And this is through our work that impacts on six key areas of society, and we just referred to them as our impact areas. The first of those is maximising the value of our abundant mineral and energy resources here in Australia. The second was uh, strengthening Australia's uh, resilience to the impact of hazards. Thirdly, optimising and sustaining Australia's water use, principally through our work in groundwater science. The fourth impact area is supporting the sustainable use of our marine environment. The fifth, creating a location enabled Australia using digital mapping for faster and smarter decision making. And the sixth was, is equipping our stakeholders with geoscience data and information to make informed decisions. By supporting evidence-based decisions through our information, our advice and our services, Geoscience Australia serves the Australian government and the Australian people to support a strong economy, a resilient society and a sustainable environment. To achieve these impacts, Strategy 2028 also includes four core commitments that outline how we will be a resilient and a high performing organisation. And these commitments are to firstly, pursue science excellence. Secondly, make the most of our vast data holdings. Thirdly, ensure supportive stakeholders. And fourthly, enhance positive organisational culture so that we perform at our best. 
Following the launch of the Decadal Strategy 2028, I asked Steve as our Chief Scientist to go one step further and identify how those four commitments, core, core, those four core commitments apply to Geoscience Australia's everyday business and our science to bring those core commitments to life. While Strategy 2028 outlines this long-term vision and the underlying principles that guide our way of working, there still remained a gap on how this applies specifically to our science as our core business. Critically, I saw that the way that we conduct our science and undertake business to meet this long-term vision cannot be taken for granted. So the Science Strategy 2028 is therefore our commitment to the way that we'll do our business and apply geoscience to Australia's most important challenges. In particular, the science strategy highlights the way in which we achieve scientific excellence by linking these outcomes and core commitments from strategy 2028 with Geoscience Australia's long-standing and underlying science principles. The six science principles were developed by one of our previous chief scientists, Dr. Clinton Foster, back in 2013. The science principles describe how Geoscience Australia conducts its science and, uh, and they enshrine our dedication to producing relevant, collaborative, quality, transparent and communicated science with a view to sustain our scientific capability. Importantly, these science principles are now enmeshed into Geoscience Australia's strategic framework through the science strategy that you're about to hear about. This expands the way that we look to utilise these science principles as not only applying to our scientific conduct, but now in the way that we achieve our business and our impact as a scientific organisation. Personally, as a, as a scientist, and more specifically by training a geologist and geochemist, um, I'm glad to see the way that these fundamental guidelines for our scientific conduct have now been articulated as a strategic framework for Geoscience Australia's business. This touches on what I find to be one of the most exciting aspects of the Science Strategy 2028, that these science principles are now mapped as a business imperative in line with our four core commitments that I outlined earlier from our decadal strategy. While the science strategy most obviously outlines our commitment to science excellence, I'd also like to touch briefly on how this strategy also contributes to the other three core commitments in strategy 2028. Through the science strategy, we will enhance our ability to maximise our interaction with our data holdings and maximise our impact as the chief custodian for national geoscientific data. Through the science strategy, we'll also be able to ensure that our science continues to foster a positive organisational culture in nurturing inclusion and collaboration in our business. And finally, and most importantly for those of you ex viewing from outside of our organisation, our science strategy articulates our commitment to working with you as stakeholders beyond fostering mutually beneficial scientific outcomes and more fundamentally in the way that we work together in an open and consultative manner when applying our science for the nation's benefit. Through this, Science Strategy 2028 captures a commitment by Steve and me to achieve scientific excellence as Geoscience Australia's core business to ultimately secure our position as the nation's trusted advisor on Australia's geology and geography. With that overarching strategic framework of strategy 2028 and the rationale of our science strategy in mind, I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Steve Hill, who will provide this much awaited preview of science strategy 2028 and how it'll be implemented in the way that we work with you every day. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, James. Uh, hello, Ninamani. I'm speaking to you all from uh, the Adelaide Plains, which is also uh, the country of the Ghana uh, people. Uh, thank you very much for joining today. It's great to have an audience. I think I saw us just tip over 270 uh, people. So. Great introduction, James. I think you've given me a lot to uh, live up to here, but um, what I really wanna do today is give you a taste of 
what has gone into developing Geoscience Australia's first science strategy. Before I get right into that, I just want to tell a little bit of a story. I think we can all recognise what you see on screen there at the moment. It's not a new um, Ferrero Rocher chocolate or lint ball um, confectionery. It is, of course, uh, COVID-19 virus. And I think it's, I think we all know that science has really been at the forefront and has been absolutely amazing in how it has contributed to the world's response to this virus and pandemic. We still have a lot of challenges ahead of us and probably the biggest challenge that the science around this pandemic has is trust, particularly of that science. And where does that trust really come from and how do we generate it? Well, it's around a whole lot of principles that sit with our science. And these are in fact, what we're going to talk about today in Geoscience Australia's Science Strategy 2028. I'll tell, just tell a little bit more of a story about how I got here today. I'm actually, as I said, I'm in Adelaide. Um, I've actually just traveled from the Geoscience Australia um, headquarters area, although we were, in, we were in lockdown in Canberra, so I was actually at home. And I've traveled across to Adelaide, but it wasn't straightforward. It took me eight weeks of what promised to be a two week process to get an SA Health permit to come across. Uh, and when I did finally get that permit, uh, there was that one little interesting line in the letter saying, before you travel, please confirm your arrival details with SA Health. And so I rang up the SA COVID hotline, which is the only access point that um, citizens have with uh, the government and the COVID situation in South Australia. And they said to me, don't worry about that. That's all a formality. Hit the road. That'll be sorted out before you get to the border. If not, at the border. And so I thought, beauty, let's get going. I've waited long enough for this permit. I'm keen to hit the road. Well, unfortunately, it didn't quite go like that. Um, I actually did need to confirm my entry into South Australia with SA Health. And what it really brought through to me was that I had been given incorrect advice by the public officers that I had otherwise trusted. What that meant then is that I was stuck in this zone between the South Australia-Victoria border and the COVID and fruit fly checkpoint at Yamba in South Australia. I think it's about an eight kilometre wide zone. It's a bit wider than shown here. I couldn't go back to Victoria because I was from the ACT and I could only transit through there, despite the advice that I was also being given by other public officers that Oh, I could just drive back into Victoria and, and wait there until I get permission to go forward. I was getting lots of facts and they were great facts, but no one was able to address or provide a way for me to be able to find solutions and, and, and know that there was some empathy and understanding of my matters of concern. And that was, I was stuck in this weird anomalous little um, jurisdictional crack if you like, between the border and the checkpoint. It meant that I then had to actually sleep in my car for two nights over the long weekend by the side of the, of the Sturt Highway and, um, and eat uh, what I had remaining of my travel snacks in the car. Um, it probably, at first, it didn't seem to be the most appealing sight in the world, but I will say that with time, I started to connect to the landscape, the geology, the vegetation, and I found it was actually a pretty interesting place. But the thing that kept on haunting me was not anger. I didn't really, I didn't feel the, the need to get angry, but it was actually a feeling that was close to disillusionment with, despite there being great science and great scientists behind these decisions and how we're dealing with COVID, it was the way that that information was being communicated and transferred through our society to me that was a that was a letdown. And I think that's a really relevant piece for what I'm talking about today. I'll just wrap it up quickly and say, the story had a happy ending. I actually um, was booked into um, a police convoy escort from the South Australian checkpoint to home quarantine. And 
made it home. I'm now isolated at home. I still haven't seen my family. I've got to wait close to two weeks for that. Um, and I also hope that during this presentation, I don't get a call from the SA COVID police checking that I am in fact home. And I do apologize if that does um, come through, I will have to just stop and take that. Otherwise, the police will be um, joining the seminar presentation. So this presentation, well, I'm gonna keep the actual design of it fairly simple. Fundamental questions, who, why, what, how, and when. And James has done a great job of uh, the heavy lifting of explaining who, who are we? Who are we at Geoscience Australia? What's our role? So I won't go through that again, um, but I will talk about why do we need a science strategy? James has talked a bit about that, but I'll say just a bit more. Then let's look at what is our science strategy, then how we, we will achieve this, and then when will we do it? So as Lisa says, let's look at why. So as I said, James talked a bit about this already, but I really want to highlight that the science underpins the performance and delivery of Geoscience Australia's strategy 2028. It really drives the, the quality, timeliness and relevance of our science to meet that delivery. And important there are the culture and principles that guide our science. James said it, I also agree. This cannot be taken for granted. It doesn't just happen. You don't just fill a building with scientists and let the magic unfold. There's a lot that goes into making sure that the science is in fact fit for purpose, relevant and high quality. So our science strategy 2028 guides how we conduct and support our science at Geoscience Australia. It also drives the activities of Geoscience Australia's Office of the Chief Scientist. Okay, so that's a bit about why. Now let's look at what. What is our, what does our strategy look like? As James already forewarned us, the strategy is really built on the six fundamental strategic science principles. And it was great to hear James acknowledge the, the work of predecessors such as Clinton Foster. And I know John A. Ross was working closely with Clinton in developing these principles, which I've updated, slightly modified um, uh, since the 2013 commencement of those, uh, of those principles. So we've got six of those principles there. What I'm going to do is go through each of those and talk about the strategic behaviors and actions. So a strategy is all about behavior and action. And so I'm going to talk about what those behaviors and actions are at Geoscience Australia. So for relevant science, we're really talking about making sure that our science, our outputs are quality assured data and information that are given to the right people in the right time frame, so they can make evidence-based decisions. And this is particularly related to the Australian government, although we do have a diverse array of stakeholders through um, research, industry, and community as well. And that key bit is about the provision of scientific advice to meet national priorities and international obligations. So what are the st strategic actions that go with that? Well, as part of our science strategy, it's about understanding the current and emerging national priorities and undertaking the science required to respond to them, influencing national and international research agendas to promote the development of science that will support current government priorities and position Australia to respond to long-term challenges, and ensuring that our investments in science are targeted both towards current stakeholder priorities and building capability to address long-term challenges. I think there's a recurring theme that hopefully comes across to you there about the immediate concerns, the immediacy of, of things that are happening, but also taking that longer term vision as well. The next of those principles that we're building on our, for our strategy is around collaborative science. And that's about meeting emergency chal uh, emerging challenges that are more complex than any single individual team or organization can achieve. I think it's really important for all of us to remember that. We're dealing with big global, by definition, issues, earth issues. And that is bigger than any one person and any one organization can achieve. 
So how we bring that together and work together is really critical. Um, and, and how we then engage with broad research and data community and also our non-scientific stakeholders. So the strategic actions there are around proactively engaging with the science community to leverage their capabilities and develop our own, engaging our stakeholders in designing scientific activity to ensure they receive and use the information and products they require. And here's one that I think all scientists need to remember and work on, and that is about acknowledging our collaborators to promote an inclusive working environment. I think sometimes we feel that we look best by showing what we do as, a, as individuals, but I actually feel that we look even better by showing what we collectively do and how well we pull together and work with a diversity of people. And then lastly, about, it's about recognising and actively listening to the different roles, capacity and priorities of the diversity of stakeholder types and ensure our science engagement is appropriate. That active listening bit, really important. The third of those principles is around quality science, which is about maximising the stakeholder confidence that the data and information we provide is accurate, repeatable, and uncertainties are explained and accounted for. That confidence that comes from the quality is really, really important, particularly for trust. And that science integrity, the reuse and repurpose of the data, actually making sure our data is right in how we've collected it and the processes behind it so that it does stand the test of time as much as possible. And so how will we achieve that? Well, very important that we comply with the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research, but also our people, attracting, retaining and developing staff with the right skills and attributes, providing fit for purpose information consistent with data inputs, limitations and uncertainties, ensuring scientific activity and information considers a range of likely scenarios and quantifies uncertainties and participating in regular evaluation of the quality of our science. And I'm going to talk at our next, next step in this presentation about that evaluation process in a bit more detail. Transparent science, key principle, and really important to demonstrate unbiased and transparent processes. What, what does go behind the scenes on the science? It's not just a black box. How do we actually get to those outcomes? Um, and, and what is the basis for those that advice that we give? Really important here is, of course, ensuring that we aspire as much as we can to fair data principles. That's making sure that our data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And that's actually a big, a big challenge for all of us. Um, we have very open data for the, for the most part, but making sure that we meet those criteria is actually a really big and important requirement that I wanna see um, us aspire to. So how will we achieve this? As I said, ensuring we aim to make our data fair, particularly the new data that we're producing, tailoring communication styles in scientific presentations and publications to the audience so they understand the science. Hopefully I'm doing that right now. Um, and ensuring that our science products are delivered in the most appropriate way. We've got two more of these principles to go through. And the fifth one is communicated science. I love this picture in the top right there about um, a fantastic event that we had at Cheer Science Australia. And it was also um, held at the ASEG conference where um, some geophysical data was actually reinterpreted and presented through music. And it was one of the most um, inspiring and um, creative events that I've seen in how science can be communicated. And I think the whole room was buzzing as a result of that. So for communicated science, we wanna ensure that the outputs are accessible and useful for a variety of stakeholders. No point in doing it if people don't know about it and can't access it. And in particular, tailoring the communication to the audience and purpose to reach more stakeholders for greater impact. One thing it doesn't say there that's also part of this is about listening. A lot of people think that communication's about standing up and I'm just gonna tell everyone, matters of fact, this is what we do. 
but we need to listen as well to make sure that our communication is appropriate. So how do we do that? Actually, I think I've already given some of this away. Seeking to communicate broadly to maximise impact, using plain language without losing integrity, the listening to concerns of stakeholders and communicating to address those. Promoting understanding and application of scientific evidence for decision making and inspiring the broader community to foster a scientifically literate public and next generation of geoscientists. That's a really exciting challenge uh, and one that doesn't come easy, that last one there. And the last of those principles that drive our strategy is about sustained science capability. This is something that we are particularly mindful of when we look at how geoscience is, is uh, faring in education institutions, in particular universities, um, but also within government, industry, and many of our other geoscience stakeholders. And this is about really to position us to undertake scientific activities that meet current and future strategic priorities and really driven by informed horizon scanning and strategic requirements for our organisation. Key role, particularly for um, chief scientists and, and something that um, I do spend a lot of time working on. And so how do we do that strategically? It's about retaining core scientific capability in-house and developing an adaptable workforce, but ensuring that we also engage with the broader scientific community to promote development, and maintain external capabilities. Also identifying future data requirements, valuing and committing to inclusive and diverse scientists that bring their authentic and best person to their science. This last point has been a major emphasis, I think particularly as part of our CEO, James Johnson's leadership, but I, I also feel that that has um, very strong buy-in and engagement through um, all of our staff at Geoscience Australia. And I must say for me, it's one of the things that I'm most um, value and most excited about with how we aspire to do our science at Geoscience Australia, bringing our best person to our science. Okay, so that's the what, that was our, that's the key pillars of our strategy. And that's all great, everyone might think, well, that all sounds good, Steve, but can you show us a little bit about how we're going to do that? And that's what I want to just um, share with you uh, in the, um, for most of the remaining time of this presentation. As James said at the start, how we're structuring the how of the strategy is through those science principles and how they've influenced our strategic actions and behaviours. But actually the thing that's really exciting is that we've then integrated them with the four core commitments of strategy 2028, of pursuing science excellence, making the most of our data, ensuring, ensuring supportive stakeholders and enhancing positive organisational culture. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read all of this, but this was really the thing that when James and I were, were discussing this, getting together on this, where the, where the penny really dropped, where on the horizontal axis across the the top there, we have those four core commitments from strategy 2028. And then on the horizontal axis, we have those six science principles that drive our strategy. And it was finding really a, a matrix of where these things intersect that really was exciting and drove how we then look at the actions that we do in our science strategy to then support strategy 2028. So I'm going to, like I said, you don't have to read all of this. I'm actually going to go through a lot of the key points. I'm not going to be comprehensive in what I go through, but I will give you a taste of some of those things that we're doing to meet that strategy. So if I look at the four core commitments, the first one is about pursuing science excellence. And I've got three examples of things that um, we will be doing and, 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 and continuing to do uh, as part of our science strategy at Geoscience Australia. They are around our science evaluations, a really interesting approach of mapping our science capability and capacity, and then really putting that effort back into the staff, the people, the scientists 
through things like our graduate program, but also looking across the entire um, career development of our staff. Our people really do drive that science excellence. So let's have a, I just wanna say a little bit about the science evaluations. I think these are a really exciting part of what we face in the next um, sort of nine to six months. And what we're looking at here is providing an assessment of the quality, relevance and impact of our science against the principles in this strategy. This is really important for us. If we're to be confident that we're doing the right thing, providing good science as the foundations for our advice, information and data, then this assessment is really important. It's important particularly for our senior executive and, and, and most important for our CEO so that he can, he can stand hand on heart and speak to our stakeholders in particular in government and say that we actually care and assess and interrogate the, um, the way that we do our science. We have had a science evaluation before in 2015-16, and um, we've been um, addressing a lot of the findings of that evaluation. And one of the things that was agreed upon was that we try to run these about every five years. The little vagary in there is because of COVID and the way of the world at the moment, an exact five years is not always immediately possible, but we've, we've, we've come pretty close to that by now embarking on our next science evaluation in the 2021-2022 period. The way we've designed our upcoming science evaluation is in two main parts. Firstly, a thematic deep dive component, and then secondly, the more traditional panel evaluation um, for and really against each of the strategy 2028 six impact areas. So rather than looking at our science in a administrative team type framework, we're actually looking at our science against the impact areas of strategy 2028. I think that's important because the fundamental question is, are we actually delivering the science to deliver strategy 2028? I love the thematic deep dive component. Um, many of what many of the things that we're looking at there actually address some of the findings and questions from the previous science evaluation. But for me, they also provide an opportunity to look at some of the things that when I started in this role in 2000, at the end of 2018, I was really keen to find out, find more about with Geoscience Australia. And those deep dive themes are around digital science maturity and capability, science capability and capacity, and developing a stakeholder framework. I'm really proud to say that we've progressed really well on those deep dives already. The digital science maturity and capability deep dive is now at final draft stage, and I thank Tanya Whiteway and Ole Nielsen, particularly for their work around that. Um, and the findings from that will um, be released very soon once we get it through that final draft stage. And it's providing some real insight into some of our strengths, but some of the, the challenges and opportunities that we need to better develop in Geoscience Australia to meet particularly the needs around digital science. The science capability and capacity deep dive, I'm actually going to talk about that in the next slide, so I won't say too much more about that. And then lastly, the stakeholder framework is um, one of the deep dives that we're, um, I, I, I feel will be an ongoing program at Geoscience Australia, but we've been doing that in a thematic way, looking at different sectors that we have stakeholders in and developing a um, collation of information about those stakeholders and how we work with them. There's been a real emphasis, not just on what we do at Geoscience Australia with those stakeholders, but I've really been trying to put up front in that framework, the actual characteristics and needs um, and the strategies of our stakeholders so that we actually effectively listen to what they are trying to do and then look at how we can best address that. Let's have a bit more of a look at the second deep dive there, the science capability and capacity deep dive. I love this one. This has 
been, as I said, something that I was very keen to do when I first started at Geoscience Australia. And I will actually acknowledge that um, some of the idea behind this actually came from the work of the Uncover um, Roadmap, which was a, a roadmap that was sponsored by um, Amira and the um, Academy of Science and a range of uh, industry partners and uh, government partners that really sought to make a difference in how we become more effective in finding high quality mineral resources, particularly the ones that are otherwise buried and have been challenging to find. And one of the things that came out of that was Robbie Rowe, who drove a lot of that, said, well, it's hard for us to see what we can do unless we know what we've got as far as capability and capacity go, who we've got and how we can address it. And I think Robbie's rationale for doing that as part of Uncover also holds true for Geoscience Australia. And I'm really also excited to say that our that Australia's chief scientist, Cathy Foley, has also recognised the importance of mapping out Australia's science capability and capacity. I think Cathy says to me, a regular comment from ministers is, if only Australian science knew what it knew. And um, it's very difficult, I think, from their perspective as ministers to see which parts of government and wider science ecosystem in Australia is able to address those different nations' needs. And I think they also find that once they pull those groups together, they all spend a fair bit of time arguing or discussing amongst themselves about what their strength and role will be in, in some of those initiatives. And I think this approach of actually providing a map of our capability and capacity is really valuable, makes a lot of sense, it's really exciting. Some of the things that it's already showing are some of our, um, our overlaps, some of our gaps, and some of our dependencies in our science capability and capacity. I should point out that the reason that we're doing both capability and capacity, I think is demonstrated a bit by the two sun, sunburst diagrams that you see on screen here. These sunburst diagrams basically show the size of the segments, of the slices of pie represent the number of people that have identified with those capabilities or capacities. The, the interesting thing is that there are some similarities between capability and capacity, but there's some key differences. And this is a compilation that Jade Anderson, who's been working um, on this project, has put together. And it's really exciting that Jade has been successful in now um, getting data on scientists in Geoscience Australia that represent um, over 90% of our scientists. I think this data here represents um, 414, 415 scientists in Geoscience Australia, which is pretty close to our main core science staff uh, in, in GA. And um, you can see that just out of interest, this one, and I said, and, and I should point out that it's very raw, very new data. It's actually, um, I had to beg Jade to pull it out of the oven and, and it still had smoke coming out of it. And if you put a skewer into it, there's going to be a lot of dough still stick to that skewer. But even here, you can see that as you go from capability to capacity, areas like business management, stakeholder engagement become more pronounced on the GA capacity side which shows that although we might have great capabilities in our staff, that the actual reality of what they do is more and more focused on science management, particularly as they become more senior. Now, we all knew that, or we intuitively feel that, but isn't it great to have an evidence-based framework and data that actually shows that and allows us to deal with it? I think it will also inform a lot of um, where we try to develop further expertise in our science at Geoscience Australia. And I also feel it'll be a key driver for areas that we don't, to, to identify areas that we don't cover and then look for collaboration outside of Geoscience Australia. And I wonder if one day we might see a similar approach perhaps for more agencies, universities and so forth in geoscience and science in Australia in general that provide just these sorts of um, maps and information. Now, there's lots more to get out of this data. It's early days, we've only just finished collecting it, 
and um, only just starting to compile it. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be great to share that in the next few months. Um, I better keep moving along. Um, another area or another action that we're really um, dedicated to working on is really our, um, our workforce, our um, graduate program, but also our entire staff and their career development in science. I think this is something that we can definitely improve on, um, but the, the real driver here is to remember that science may be fundamental to our delivery, but people are fundamental to our science. And if we look at <clears throat> the people that we have doing our science, typically we see early career scientists. They have that challenge of firstly, recruitment and entry into Geoscience Australia, and then establishing themselves. And this is why we put so much emphasis on a Geoscience Australia graduate program that really targets very early career researchers. We found that to be a big gap in our um, staff profile. Then we look at mid-career researchers and a lot of their challenges are around growth opportunity, the feeling that they've been in the job for a while, but where are they going with it? What's going, what opportunities are around that? And then the later career researchers, really important, st typically starting to think more about their legacy and the custodianship of the data, the work, the science, and how that might continue on. And so a key part that, of, of, that we wanna play uh, in, is, is helping our staff at Geoscience Australia at all of these career levels um, to, to better um, to better function, develop, and, and meet perhaps some of their concerns. Okay, let's, um, let's move perhaps a little more quickly through some of these last ones, um, and that is making the most of our data. Really important one. Um, a lot, as I said, is coming out of the digital science uh, capability and maturity mapping that we're doing as part of the evaluations. Um, but really our um, our you know, three examples of things that we're looking to really develop in the next, next part with this strategy are accelerating our engagement with digital and computational science. I'm really proud to say that we're a partner in uh, the NCI, uh, the National Computing Infrastructure, Computational Infrastructure at ANU. And I actually feel that at Geoscience Australia, we need to make sure that we're main, not only maintaining that, but developing new opportunities and new ideas about how we can develop develop this, our science and, and have it integrate with that. And it's great that um, we have regular discussions with Ben Evans from the NCI and are looking all the time at opportunities for, for further developing that. I've already talked a bit about the fair data principles. Um, that is going to be an increasing uh, emphasis in what we do at Geoscience Australia and really encouraging that innovative geoscience information and data delivery. I haven't spoken a lot about innovation. Um, it's not because I don't think it's important. It's just uh, in the time allowed, um, I think innovation is almost a topic unto itself. And Geoscience Australia does have a separate innovation um, strategy and guidelines. Uh, so I didn't want to uh, steal too much of the thunder and replicate that here. The third of these core commitments and the, and the strategic actions around that is ensuring supportive stakeholders. And I've already mentioned that we're developing a, a stakeholder framework as part of our deep dives with our science evaluations, but also two other areas that I wanna highlight are around the incredible inroads that we've made in the last two years, basically around um, recognizing and then acting towards the best practice in land, air and marine access for our geoscience programs. In Geoscience Australia, we call that team the LAMA team, which stands for Land, Air, Marine Access. And that team has really come out of um, very little, next to nothing, uh, two years ago, and is now an integrated part of our workflow in how we do our field work effectively, how we work with stakeholders, and, and really how we do our science uh, across our nation. Really important, really important to get right. And an area where there's been really um, a raising of the bar and expectation around how we do that. And our LAMA team, um, I just think are absolutely fantastic in how they've, they've innovated and really brought those new approaches 
and, and workflow into Geoscience Australia. And then um, the third one listed there is about our scientific outreach program, um, particularly engaging with schools and communities. We have an incredibly active education centre and museum collection and display and also our library services at Geoscience Australia that work, I think, um, almost second to none in how they do their work and deliver that and get geoscience out into the community and represent Geoscience Australia there. And I want to make sure that that is not only continues to be supported, but is also really closely integrated with our scientists and our science programs. And the last one, and one that I must say that a few of us, or many of us at Geoscience Australia are extremely passionate about, and that is enhancing positive organisational culture. And this is, I think, one of the real um, key pillars around our science, what we can really develop in our science strategy and what will make a big difference to how we do geoscience in Geoscience Australia, but also um, more widely. And that is around some actively supporting diversity and inclusive science and scientists, making sure that scientific voice and opinion is able to be expressed and held by a great diversity uh, and, and is included uh, as part of how we do our science. Also embracing indigenous science and its exchange with traditional science. I really wanna emphasize that word exchange I think that's where the opportunities are about that two-way exchange of information, data, knowledge, and, um, and how we share that, um, and really making sure that that is also an integrated part of how we do our work at Geoscience Australia and how we have those connections. We've just this year released our reconciliation action plan and integrated into that are a lot of actions around how we do our science and there's a lot of expectations particularly for me as chief scientist in how I support that. And then the last point there, the third one, uh, it was just an example, is about science and scientist engagement across generations from early career and into retirement. I mentioned that earlier and I talked a bit about the graduate program, mid-career and late career researchers and um, I, you know I can't emphasize that enough um, that it's actually not just one particular segment or demographic, part of our demographic, it actually is across all the career points um, for all of our different uh, scientists and staff members. I think we're on to the last bit, just to wrap it up, and that is when. And looking at science strategy and when, what we're looking to do is release this strategy following Geoscience Australia Executive Board endorsement, which is scheduled for later this month. It also gives an opportunity to listen to feedback, comment from staff, external stakeholders, um, from particularly from this presentation. And what we're looking to release is a um, Science Strategy 2028 short booklet or fold out that actually sits well with the look and feel of our Strategy 2028 booklet and then a separate implementation plan that will be as a report. Just a few other key dates. I mentioned the science evaluations underway with our deep dives and our evaluation panels are scheduled for the first half of 2022. Not sure yet if that's going to be face-to-face -face or online. It's a little bit out of our control about what happens there. Um, our GA graduate program, got a great bunch of graduates this year that, um, that we're, um, really helping through as part of their program. And then next year, we'll be getting ready for our next phase of recruitment for a 2023 commencement. So that is that we take on graduates now every second year and particularly target that early career uh, graduate. Now, many of the other things I've talked about, the actual timeframes for them are part, uh, are explained in detail in the implementation plan report, but um, many of them are actually ongoing and we set annual key deliverables around them. I'd like to thank you for hearing me out with the uh, Geoscience Australia Science Strategy. I hope that there's been some things that have really, um, you know, really twigged your brain about 
um, what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, um, and I'm more than happy to take questions. And I also particularly, I want to thank all of you for listening, but I also want to thank um, you know, all of these different people that I list here and, and many that I perhaps haven't listed that have been just great supporters, inspiration um, for me in developing uh, this Science Strategy 2028. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now stop sharing my screen and hand over to our CEO, James Johnson. Well, thank you, Steve, for what's a, a really fascinating body of work. Uh, clearly a lot of work along the way too, to pull it together. And I really like the way it's picked up threads from previous work, like the science principles, and in particular, how those principles have been translated into actions uh, under the heading of, you know, how we're going to achieve this. Um, we do have a number of questions in the chat line, so I'll facilitate those. We have a question from Julia Martin. Uh, saying what will be the quality measure? How are we going to measure um, whether we're being successful with this strategy? Yeah, um, so we're putting a lot of emphasis on our science evaluations and particularly in the panel um, sessions that we're having where we're looking at each of the six impact streams. And we've um, actually just in the process of, uh, well, we finalised the terms of reference for those panels and we're now developing a, um, a matrix that um, has some of the key measures and then the different ways that we're going to be able to, uh, in many cases, quantify and in other cases, either semi-quantify um, how we've been um, tracking and performing in those areas. Thank you, Steve. Uh, look, there's also an interesting comment rather than question from Ian Wolf talking, about, I think referring to your drama of getting back to South Australia. In earlier days, any country travel required emergency tinned food and water for occasional flooded roads or such. So I think that's just as relevant in interstate travel uh, during COVID times. Um, Marita Bradshaw has expressed interest in the, the music, um, the geophysics expressed as music presentation, but uh, and sought a link, but that's been addressed by Matthew. Uh, so I won't dwell on that. Right. Uh, here's a question saying, could you please address how to counteract misinformation and disinformation? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a great question. And um, I can't, I can't promise to have, there's the solution. Hey, we've got a science strategy, I can solve every science challenge in the world. But um, I think a lot of it is also about how we are able to be on the front foot and proactive about um, how we listen to matters of concern and communicate and therefore um, make a more resilient and informed public in how they then deal with misinformation. I think at the moment where there's a void or there's gaps in how our public, and I mean that in the most general sense, how they are engaged, informed and, and, and actually know what's really going on, I think as long as there's a void there, there are there's junk that can fill that void. And I think for us, it's about actually ensuring the quality and um, our ability to get that, that message and story and, and information and framework out for our, for our public. Thanks, Steve. Um, there's another comment from Yusin Lay uh, indicating that if there's an appetite for uh, more of these musical um, presentations, we can try to have another concert in 2023 at the International Airborne Conference that Australia will host. So if you're a fan of this possibility, please deluge Yusin with your input and endorsement. A great question now from Gareth Davies around collaboration. Collaboration is very important, but from experience, it can also raise new challenges. For example, technical problems can sometimes fall through the cracks if collaborators all assume someone else has taken care of them. Can you offer any tips on how to collaborate well? <laughs> yeah, um, collaboration, you know, it's, it's anyone who tells you that they're good at collaboration and have and are successful and are, and are always a successful collaborator, probably um, are misrepresenting themselves or are not fully aware of the complexity involved. And I think part of the question really identifies that. Um, I found, you know, in my career, there's been a lot of uh, opportunities for collaboration, uh, particularly through cooperative research centres, um, also back when I was in university and collaborating with people, but then particularly in government. And one of the things I've found is that 
collaboration is not easy for everybody. Um, and one of the real important things is to really reward and support and, and, and look to look to um, get behind people that are going into collaboration with that willingness to listen and learn. And what I've generally found is that through a collaboration type project, there's almost a distillation that takes place. I've certainly seen that in cooperative research centres where at the start of a CRC, everybody wants to do their own thing or everybody wants to do everything um, and kind of is jostling and muscling around uh, everyone else. But by the by a certain period through that CRC and certainly by the end of it, there's been a distillation where you see yourself surrounded by people that you trust, you know, you value. And I find that those relationships actually um, tend to perpetuate um, for the best. And so I think there's some real learnings there about collaboration and, and trust. Yeah, that trust okay. is really key. Thanks, Steve. Uh, there's a question from Chuck McGee. Um, it simply says, when and how is this data collected? But I think it related to when you were speaking about the capability and capacity mapping. Okay, yeah. So um, it was actually, I'll, I'll be honest, I can't believe that we've been successful in collecting that data. Um, as I said, we have, I did try before and um, there was actually, I think there was still a lot to learn about how that data is used and, and what it all meant. And what I've found is that the level of trust that we've now developed, um, that we've had fantastic engagement. And I think people like Jade Anderson and Matthew Tay at Geoscience Australia have also done a lot of hard work about getting people on board with it. And the way that we've done it is not to approach every single individual. That would, that would be a very difficult uh, task to achieve. Um, but what we've done is on a team by team basis, and we've, we've certainly encouraged team leaders to um, engage with their staff, but most importantly for the team leaders to provide that representation. And we've got about 50 teams, um, scientific teams, sorry, in Geoscience Australia. And as I said, we've pretty much got a response from all of those teams that cover the scientific staff within them. And okay. we've been asking people around their um, capabilities that correspond to Australian research codes. We've modified that a bit as well. Um, and there's a whole spreadsheet that we've got some key um, you know, data um, requests that sit in there. Okay, Steve, we can briefly deal with one more question, but it's one that I know has been topical and on your mind of, of late. It's, a, it's from Mike Barlow saying, regarding early career, yes, good to see um, the encouragement, I assume, he means of early career and fostering of that early career scientist. But we, Australia and the world, are running out of geoscience graduates. In this regard, will GA take a more active role in encouraging students into geoscience and encourage the government to keep earth science schools open? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you're right, James. I mean, you know that you and I and a lot of the senior exec and a lot of the staff at GA have been talking about this and we've, we've actually been approached and had discussions with a lot of the university staff and the and, and a lot of the key stakeholders for the university um, for the universities for both their research and also the, the quality graduates um, across really important fields that are produced there and um, yeah look geoscience Australia is really supportive of um, of the of the university sector the challenge for us is that we don't have a direct mandate into that space, given that um, a lot of the de key decisions around support and outcome are driven by either other parts of government, but most particularly also through the university administration systems. Um, and also a lot of what um, is, is there to be addressed is also up to the academics at the university to band together and make those decisions about how they're going to um, address some of their challenges as well. And at Geoscience Australia, I think I, I, I can speak quite confidently that we're very keen to be involved and support um, support that as best we and as best and most as most appropriately we can. And I just briefly support that um, where uh, it's a complex issue because it's not actually the government shutting down geoscience schools, it's the level of priority afforded them by their host um, academic institution. And Steve and I are talking 
together, but also externally about how we can influence universities uh, to see the societal importance of geoscience in the long term. Uh, but that's definitely a work in progress. But thank you for the question. We're going to have to wrap it up there. There are more questions. Um, but we're not able to field them given the time. Um, thank you very much, Steve, for a terrific presentation. Thank you for so such a wonderful audience. We had a very high engagement today, up near 300. Um, and thank you for giving us the time this morning to hear the direction in science that Geoscience Australia will be taking. I'll put in a plug now for next week's seminar. We'll be hearing from Dr. Steph McLennan in a seminar entitled Treading Lightly, how geoscience is revealing human impacts in Antarctica. Most human activities in Antarctica are in rare ice-free areas and leave an enduring legacy on the fragile landscape. In this seminar, you're going to find out how Geoscience Australia's work uh, is helping to better manage our environmental impact in Antarctica. The seminar, again, will be online only, but please join us then. And in the meantime, have a great week. Thanks again.